I want to take where we were this morning and I want to take it to another step because I talked a little bit this morning about, and this is just the 30 second review, uh, a, a little bit about the difference in the flesh and the spirit, not, not the flesh the way we think of it, like sinning versus doing the right thing, but literally the natural man versus the invisible man. Jesus takes his disciples through that journey in John 6 of you're looking at a natural man and you're worried because I told you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you're freaked out because looking at a natural man, that's cannibalistic and vampire talk, eating flesh and drinking blood. Plus, you're also afraid that I'm asking you to give up Passover. I'm asking you to do something else. But Jesus says, if I were to disappear in the flesh, you would need to understand. And I will disappear in the flesh, Jesus is saying. When I do, you'll realize that all this was about the spirit. And remember when we did this today? Just gave you a little, just gave you a little podium knock, tell you how we love the tangible. There's that little moment this morning. That's really the spark of where we want to go tonight. Because we, we love the tangible so much, it's, it's, it's almost like a Jewish holdover for us. Because the Jews had the taste, smell, scent, and tangible presence of the tabernacle. They could literally touch it. They could see it sitting on the hill. And that's very, very hard to surrender the tangible for the invisible. It's hard to give up that which you can touch for that which you can't touch. And it almost looks as if the new covenant's going backwards. Because the old covenant has all this stuff, trappings, priests, and lambs, and blood, and knives, and bells, and incense. Then the new covenant has nothing. External signs, wonders, and miracles happen at the hand of the Holy Spirit, but it has nothing that identifies you as this person is saved just by looking at them. And I think sometimes we're so desperate to have some of those things that religion has actually created some externals so that you can tell which denomination I belong to. So our denomination doesn't wear this. Our denomination doesn't do this with our hair. Our denomination doesn't watch that. Our den- and it's almost as if we need, we're trying to build little camps of identity so that we can have a tangibleness about who we are. And I think this is because we are still infatuated with the God of Sinai. Because the God of Sinai makes a lot of noise. He's loud. There's darkness. There's blasting trumpets. There's noise. You cannot help but have the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you approach Sinai. I mean, who would not be impressed when Charlton Heston comes down that mountain screaming <laughs> about those Ten Commandments? It's just that holy moment. And when we see that, we think this is what God ought to look like. And for the Jews in both the Old Testament and in that first century where Jesus is, they have an awesome awe for Mount Sinai. When they think of Moses, that's the apex. And when they think of all the things that happened at Sinai, that's, that's the holiness of God. That's the tangible, and dare we, dare we say, the thing you can feel, even though you, could, you weren't supposed to touch it. But it could be touched. It was a real mountain. It was the real thing. And then comes Jesus and everything is spiritualized. Everything is internalized. Everything becomes a part of what you don't touch with your hands and what you don't see. And in some ways, we still view God at his most holy, at that tangible Sinai. I actually think it's to our shame that in the church, we know more about Hebrew stories of folklore than we know the book of Hebrew story of the two mountains. I mean, the average Sunday school could tell you Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but if you asked what are the two mountains of the book of Hebrews, a lot of people in the modern church would say, I didn't know there were two mountains in the book of Hebrews. I mean, we could tell you David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion's den, but then when it came time to differentiate between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, not as geographical points on the map, but as spiritual locations, a lot of us would be lost. And if we did, if we were able to identify a Sinai and a Zion, we might not realize that the spiritual relevance of them is that one has passed away and one has come to fruition. One is no longer relevant while the other is presently relevant. I say this because if we do know the two mountains, a lot of us would have Sinai being Moses and the law. And in most churches, we would say, well, we're not required to keep that. That's still the standard of God's holiness. And then Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem, that's someday. That's where we're going. And so I really think we're in a church world caught between two mountains. We're kind of running away from Sinai. We know that that's surely not where we're supposed to be. All of the trappings of, of Judaism. But we don't really claim Zion as our own because we have all of these scriptures, stuff in Revelation, stuff in the epistles. But we go, this stuff's got to be physical. It's got to be tangible. It's got to be real. It's got to be a big city about to come down and land on the planet someday that I'm going to be able to touch. Another thing that I need to be tangible. And have you noticed that a lot of us are actually looking forward to the time when all the things that are invisible now become visible and that we think that's the apex of when God does it the way he really wants to do it. He had a tangible Old Covenant, now an invisible New Covenant, 
And because we're mentally caught between two mountains, we don't realize we're at Sinai because we can't imagine that the best that God has to offer will always be invisible. We just can't imagine that we're at a place where the work is finished if we'll allow it to be finished. Instead, because we're caught between two mountains, we think we're always heading towards Zion. In fact, when I was a kid, old him in the church, we are marching. I see some heads nodding. Yeah, you, know you know where they're going. We are marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. Why are we still marching there? Because we've left Sinai behind. We're on our way to what is to come. And we're going through that big place, that valley between those mountains. Let's see if this is scriptural. All right. Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read through the whole I want to read through both mountains, and we'll, we'll reserve the commentary until we're finished. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that burned with fire, and to blackness, and darkness, and tempest. 19. And the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Parentheses. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. In parentheses. And now here's a transition. Watch the conjunction. Watch the rebuttal. But... You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And I want to stop there because we just introduced two mountains. If you'll notice at the top of verse 18, you have not come to the mountain. And then if you'll notice at the top of verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion. We are not in a valley betwixt two mountains. We are not in the transition age between two covenants. We are not at Sinai, and yet we are not going to Zion. We are not at Sinai because we have already come to Mount Zion. So what we have if you believe the 12th chapter of Hebrews is a biblical fact. We are not a people torn betwixt two mountains. We're not camped out in the valley waiting to find where the Lord will take us, but instead we have come to a mountain. And we want to investigate the mountain we've come to, but to do that I really want to take a look first at the mountain that we are not on because I spent way too much time on that mountain mentally and spiritually, especially when you consider according to this text I'm not supposed to be there. And one of its first telltale signs is that it is touchable. It is tangible. It is real. You have not come to the mountain that may be touched. That tells me that we're dealing with the things that man can handle. What could he handle? He could handle the trappings of Judaism. These are tangible things. They're not, it's not always just about putting your fingers on them, but it's about being to identify them as actual things, actual performances, actual works. Let's get context. Hebrews 12 badly needs context because Hebrews 12 freaked a lot of people out because the chapter opens with God the disciplinarian which in the middle of this glorious book of a supreme Jesus better than Moses better than Aaron better than Jerusalem better than the temple better than your priesthood better than your sacrifices then all of a sudden you have a father who chastises you a son and if you don't get chastised you're a bastard and you're right smack dab in all of this glorious talk about a superior Jesus and now you have the disciplinarian God and a lot of people begin to pull the first several verses of Hebrews 12 and use it actually against the message of grace to say, see, God is the disciplinarian. Now, the author realizes what we're going to do with this, and thus he introduces us to two mountains. And I think it's very crucial that the author picks up on our, pre our predilection to see God's discipline as hateful or God's discipline as punitive and that God's always smacking us. And so he shows us what mountain we are not on and then shows us what mountain we are on, because if you know what mountain you are on, it will change the way you think of God's discipline. But if you don't know what mountain you are on, or perhaps you are misinformed and think you're still at Sinai, 
Bad things happen at Sinai. What happened at Sinai? We just read them. If you touched it, you died. And if that's your idea of what God is, then when you read the first few verses of 12 and you hear discipline, you think, if I do the wrong thing, God's going to kill me. However, if you have come to Zion, a mountain in which there is God and there are angels and there's the church of the firstborn, just men made perfect, and there's Jesus, the mediator. If you realize where you are there, then you start to change your concept of God's discipline and don't look at it as God trying to discipline you on every bad thing that you do, but rather discipline you the way a coach disciplines an athlete, the way a parent disciplines a child to improve their performance so that they maximize fruit production on the vine. And so this mountain stuff is huge. And anytime I have someone come to me and say, hey, and you grace people won't teach the discipline of God, even though Hebrews 12 teaches it, I realize I'm dealing with someone who still thinks that they're at Sinai or they're stuck in a valley between two mountains. The author wants to clear up the discipline issue by explaining to you where you belong and explaining to you where you don't belong. But right in front of this passage, that's broad context, immediate context, We were introduced to a man named Esau. This seems completely out of place when you're coming fresh off the discipline topic and going into the mountain analogy. Because the author says that we don't want to be like Esau, the fornicator. Had a root of bitterness inside of him. What does Esau do? Esau's fornication, by the way, in in the Greek doesn't have much to do with sex. Esau's fornication has to do was selling himself for temporary gratification. That's what fornication is. It's the selling yourself for temporary gratification as opposed to marriage, which is the giving yourself for long-term gratification. The the reason that God admonishes against fornication in the word is because God wants your best long-term gratification, not just short-term gratification that brings pain. So what makes... Esau, a fornicator, is that Esau has an inheritance. Everything that his daddy's belongs to him. But one day he's hungry, and so he comes to his brother Jacob in what is one of the most bizarre stories in the Old Testament. Who would do this, right? Jacob is making stew. He must be one heck of a cook because Esau smells it, wants a bowl so bad that he says, I'll give you my inheritance if you'll give me a bowl of soup because I'm starving. What good is my inheritance if I fall over dead? So Jacob, happy to rip him off. <laughs> Jacob's, he, Jacob's name in the Hebrew actually means heel catcher, a guy that will trip you from behind. Yeah. So Jacob is glad to trip if you give him the opportunity. So Jacob ladles him out a bowl of soup, hands it to him, and makes him agree, hey, I get your inheritance. And the book of Hebrews chapter 12 says Esau soon regretted that and repented bitterly in tears, but he could not receive the inheritance because he'd already given that inheritance away. The warning that we are being given as God's people is, don't trade your long-term inheritance for the temporary gratification of doing it through your flesh. So where performance comes in, and you can feel good about your performance in front of God, you can lay aside the, the, the expectation of the putting your hands on an eternal inheritance so that you can temporarily be gratified. This is what's happening with a lot of our performances in the church. We're putting a lot of performance on so that we can gratify the lust of our flesh that need to do something. I think we've been misinformed. We always think lust of the flesh is sexual or or is lust for things that are sinful on the outside. The lust of the flesh is when your flesh really wants to get involved. Your flesh just needs its back padded. We just need to hear good job. You did, and I posted a sermon today. In fact, on our website, that servants hear, well done, sons receive glory. Remember where Jesus says tells the parable and says, servant, enter in thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we stand in church and we quote, that's what I want. That's what I want God to do. And we don't realize that what Jesus is saying, he's saying to a bunch of Jews under the old covenant, heading into the new covenant. Jesus comes according to the book of Hebrews to bring many sons to glory. While we we're sitting around in the church, hoping he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That would pat our flesh right on the back. If he would say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. But it's not about good and faithful servant. It's about being a son and receiving the father. So in a moment of lust, Esau sells his soul for a bowl of soup. He's a fornicator. He takes temporary gratification. He surrenders long-term benefit. Me, such a proponent of individual liberty, it really bothers me anytime we lay a piece of our liberty down so we can have a long-term, or so we can have a short-term gratification. We lay down long-term liberty so that we can have a short-term moment of safety or peace. And we give up the liberty that is ours 
as children of God. Why would we do this? Well, according to the book of Hebrews, the reason we would do this is because we don't know which mountain we belong on. And we think we are a Sinaiic people. We think that it is all about what we can touch. Or, let's say it this way, we think that Christianity is all about how we feel. So we're very closely attached emotionally to our Christianity. How does it make me feel? I want to feel like I'm God's righteousness. I want to feel like I've got everything the Lord says I've got. And if I don't feel it, I don't trust that I have it. And then we say we're faith people, but we're really just a flesh people waiting to feel what we say we believe. And so if we would just receive what he's done for us as an inheritance, we'd realize we're not in a valley between two mountains. We'd certainly realize we're not a mountain that burns, a, a, a mountain of blackness. We would realize where we are and what that means for our walk. So not about having you to have, surrender a long-term inheritance for a short-term, temporary, emotional experience. You've not come to the mountain that may be touched. You're not there. It can be touched, but you're not there. Your Christianity is not about what you can taste, touch, feel, or experience. Your Christianity is about the finished work of Christ, who he is, and what he has done on your behalf. That might be touched, it burned with fire and blackness. I, I, I jotted this. I always put this in my notes in my Bible because this is a word that I think um, kind of brings this verse out. Notice the text says it is not burned with, with uh, fire blackness darkness and tempest and i would be bothered by blackness and darkness because they seem like the same thing they go why is the author repetitive they say blackness and darkness. well it's because and you can probably imagine because this wasn't written in the english this was written in greek and i don't know if when we started translating we just didn't understand the word as well or what but really the greek is this this mountain is burning with fire and blackness and gloom and tempest so really, doom and gloom preaching can only come from one mountain. Because gloom and doom only exists at Sinai. So if you are hearing gloom and doom gospel, that all things are getting worse, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, the world's going in a downward spiral, you have forgotten the seed of the kingdom that Jesus dropped into the ground. In fact, I, I think we have an enormous amount of disrespect for the seed of the kingdom that Jesus dropped in the ground. What did Jesus say? The kingdom is like a seed, and once it's dropped in the ground, it grows, and it grows so large that all the fowls of the air can come and rest in its branches. Did you know that in the Bible, the Old Testament, fowls are always bad? And yet here's the kingdom with resting places for the fowls of this earth. The kingdom literally an oasis in the middle of the desert of this planet. So if the rest of the world is going to hell, there still ought to be an oasis that's springing forth. So if all you're hearing is gloom and doom, gloom and doom, we're losing the battle. I promise you the sermon is being inspired by someone who just touched Sinai. Because they've linked up with their emotions and then dragged those emotions into the pulpit. This is why I have a problem if you spend all week long watching CNN and Fox News so you can develop your Sunday morning sermon. What you're going to do is be closely married to your emotional response when you put five verses on top of that and call it the gospel. Because all you've done is feed yourself the information of the world, which is invariably gloom and doom. The only anointing you're going to be able to find in that is that Sinai, a place you're not even supposed to be touching because you don't belong there, because you're God's people, because you're not fornicating Esau's who are trading long-term inheritance for temporary emotional results. So for you, it's not about making sure this fits here, that fits here, or that you have an emotional connection, but it's resting in what's been done for you. We're seeing a lot of this in the church, aren't we? So we see, I see it in my walk. It frustrates me. I say, Father, I don't want to be a slave to my passion. I don't want to be a slave to my emotions. I don't want to determine my value based on how I feel. I don't want to determine our services, our meetings, based on some fleshly metric. How many people showed up? How many people went to an altar? How many people shouted? Did you get a lot of amens? Did people look like they were really engaged? But just allowing the word to do its work, allowing the seed to take effect. Because if I need all of those other things, what I'm really saying to the Lord is, I have one hand firmly entrenched at Sinai, and I need an emotional connection to the things of God so that I know I have it because I can feel it. How did you know you were at Sinai? Because the verse opens with, it's a mountain that can be touched. It's a mountain that you can, you can physically and emotionally grab hold of, but it burns with fire, it's black, it's gloomy, 
It's gloom and doom. 19, the sound of a trumpet, the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word not be spoken to them anymore. I want to take 19, 20, 21. If you'll notice when I was reading, I opened parent, parenthetical and said, here's parentheses. And I said, close parentheses. We didn't just do that. I wanted to show you that the open parentheses, closed parentheses were trying to explain something and they also contained quotations. So look at 20. They could not endure what was commanded. Quote, and if you see this in your written text, it's probably italicized. That's not because it's not in the original text, because the quote mark indicates that you are looking at something that's been previously written before. So in this case, they could not endure what was commanded, colon, quote, and it so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot through with an arrow, means that this text, the quoted part of the text, appears somewhere in the Old Testament, go on to 21. And so terrifying was the sign that Moses said, comma, quote, here comes another one, another Old Testament passage, I am exceeding afraid and trembling. Go to Exodus chapter 19, verse 12, because I want to grab some of this. I want to make sure that we can integrate it into our understanding of Hebrews 12. Exodus chapter 19, verse number 12. Moses is going to hear from God in regards to the children of Israel. And God says this about this mountain. Let's take our time right here. Watch this. See if you see anything that's familiar between Exodus 19 and Hebrews 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves. Do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Verse 13. Not a hand shall touch him. He shall surely be stoned or shot through with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. It's so dangerous to touch Sinai. You couldn't even touch a guy that had touched Sinai. So if you touch Sinai... That guy had to die, but no one could grab you and kill you. They had to actually shoot you from a distance. Not a hand shall touch him, be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. Do you remember Hebrews 12? We had trumpets blasting. It's got blackness, we've got darkness, we've got gloom, we've got trumpet blast. Trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain, near the mountain. 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people, sanctified the people, washed their clothes. Let's stop here for a moment. Moses heard God say all of this on top of the mountain, comes back down the mountain, relays that to the people. Okay? Did you, did you catch all the things God said? 15. He said to the people, be ready for the third, third day. Do not come near your wives. Time out. Yeah. Did you see that one? Did, did God say anything about not coming near your wives? When we were back in verse 12... And verse 13, when God was telling them what it looked like at the mountain and what God expected out of them, did God say one word about going home and not having sex for 72 hours? Not one word. Yet when Moses comes down the mountain, Moses tells them everything God told him at the top of the mountain. He said, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Here's what I believe happens to Moses. It's very typical to what happens to people who get used to touching Sinai. You get used to touching Sinai, you get used to the gloom and the doom, you get used to the darkness and the blackness. You get used to what is the perceived awe and holiness of God. And you believe that if, it's, if, if a little bit is holy, a whole lot more is holier. And I think Moses comes down the mountain having instructions from God. And he looks at people and says, listen, if it's holy for us to not touch the mountain. And it's holy for us to take baths. And it's holy for us to change our clothes. It's super holy for us to not have sex for the next three days. And I say this to you because I wanted you to see it. I wanted you to find if God said this. God did not say this. Moses said this because Moses had a perception that he could do something else that would look even more holy. Wow, what if I didn't just bring a bunch of clean people to God? What if I brought a bunch of people to God who had not been near their spouse, who had refrained even from sex because there was that idea of how unclean that would make it, even though the rite of purification from sex didn't take three days. Wouldn't have been as if they would have needed all three days to cleanse themselves before they came to the Father. But I think that Moses, infatuated with touching the emotion of Sinai, decides that if a little performance works, then a whole lot more works. And I've seen this happen in churches and in ministries. If we can get a little bit of law and we see any kind of results in a little bit of law, what would a little bit more law look like? And then what if we get a little bit more law? And then we get a little bit more law and we start building bigger and bigger and bigger fences and we start taking more of your liberty and more of your freedom in the guise of your own safety, in the guise of your own security, in the guise of your own prosperity until you don't have any liberty at all. And in a very tangible way, even something as beautiful as being with your spouse becomes 
somehow wicked, fleshly, worldly, sinful, and sensual. And then we wonder why we have all of the confusion that we have on what is appropriate. When we've been robbing people of life and liberty and freedom and doing it all in the guise of more holy. Because that's what Sinai looks like. We haven't come to this mountain. He says to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this text. This is amazing to me. Next verse. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning there were thunderings. Do you saw this in Hebrews 12? It was thunder. It was lightning. Thick cloud on the mountain. Sound of a trumpet. Very loud. All the people who were in the camp trembled. Notice the immediate response of the people when they get near Sinai. They hear the trumpet. They see the gloom and doom. They feel the earthquake. They see, they see the lightning. They feel the thunder. And they stand at the base of the mountain, they fear and they tremble. What will happen the longer that we put fearing and trembling into people in response to what we perceive to be the holiness of God? Where will they end up? Well, we know according to the book of Romans that the more law that we put on them, the more that will intensify their desire to sin. The more that you tell people don't do this, the more they're going to want to do that. In fact, the more that you say don't do this, that's the only thing they're going to want to do. Paul said, I was alive. The law came, sin revived, I died. I like to say to people, if you want a real sin revival in your church, just start preaching the law. <laughs> or I'll say it this way, if you want a real sin revival, just make something off limits. Hammer that thing. Put big signs up about how we don't do that here, that's not allowed here. Watch how that becomes the vice, that becomes the thing, that becomes what we try to hide, the thing we try to wonder if we can get by with. Because the moment that it becomes restricted, and this is why Paul released people. See, I believe that the Apostle Paul believed in dangerous liberty. The kind of liberty that if people don't follow the Holy Spirit, things are going to get out of hand. He's got Christians suing Christians in the sixth chapter of Corinthians in front of secular court. And he says, why couldn't you guys just be wronged? Why are you letting unbelievers judge you? He said, don't you know who the kind of people that are judging you are extortioners and fornicators and abominable and fearful and sexually immoral? And such were some of you, but you've been washed and you've been sanctified and you've been justified. He says, and all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any of them. And then he warns them about fornication, sleeping with temple prostitutes, and how if they do that, they join themselves to a temple prostitute. He never invokes the power of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. He never tells them not to do it. He just reminds them of who they used to be, tells them who they are, and then says, let me introduce you to dangerous liberty. All things are lawful. Nothing is off limits. Paul's sermon is, is 1 Corinthians 6.12 is really this. You can do whatever you want. You are a free people. However, if you do just whatever you want, here's your warning. It is not that God will destroy you because you're not at Sinai. You will not be shot through with an arrow. There will not be thunder. There will not be lightning. There will not be blackness. There will not be a tempest. There will not be the sound of a trumpet. God is not forbidding you to come near. In His holiness, He has done something powerful in your life. You're not stuck in a valley in between. You're actually at a different mountain. But here's what will happen if you take all things are lawful and just do whatever. Some things will tear you down emotionally. Some things will destroy the relationships that you have in your life. You might go bankrupt. You might lose your marriage. You might lose your job. You might get sick. You might die before your time. If these are things you're willing to risk and you're willing to accept, by all means, explore your liberty. Not all things are expedient. Not all things are profitable. Not all things are going to do me good. Not all things are going to build me up. That's dangerous liberty. But if I'm introduced to the power of the Holy Spirit and what mountain I dwell on, then I'll begin to, to literally dwell on that mountain and see what is on that mountain. I'm getting a little ahead of myself with that other mountain. I want to make sure we understand what happens the longer we hang out near Sinai. Okay? The longer we're hanging out near Sinai, we've got all this blackness and problems going on. This is Exodus 19. This is the, the children of Israel being told, don't do this, don't do that. And they begin to tremble. But look at Exodus chapter 20. One chapter later, Exodus chapter 20, verse Let's do verses 18 and 19, because we're going to watch how the people have responded a whole chapter later. All the people, here's what they did. Notice past tense. They witnessed. When did they witness it? Way back in 19, one chapter ago. The people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Unless they begin to distance themselves. What we talk about today, we begin to distance ourselves and separate ourselves and put a little space between us and God. Verse 19. And then they said to Moses, you talk with us and we will hear, but not God speak with us lest we die. 
I think Exodus 20 and 19 is one of the tragic verses of the Old Testament. Israel just surrendered their ability to hear the voice of God and put it in an advocate named Moses. Why would you ever give up your ability to hear from God so that somebody else could hear from God for you instead of you hearing from God? Maybe it's a lack of trust. I don't think God will speak to me. Maybe it's a lack of trust in yourself. I don't think I know how to listen. But according to this, it was because God was so holy and we are not holy. God is so powerful and we are not powerful. God is so mighty and we are not mighty. And that kind of God, I don't think I can listen to. I don't think I can understand. By the time Jesus gets on the earth, the common man has no concept of how to hear from God. He doesn't even really have the ability to hear from God. And when he speaks to God, like I said this morning, he's got to go through Aaron, who's got to go through Moses, who's got to go all the way to God. But as far as you hearing from God, you can't. By the time Jesus arrives, people aren't in the mode you and I have become so accustomed to saying, I believe God said to me. If you had said, I believe God said to me, you were crazy. You were nuts. There was no internalization of the spirit in this hour. You speak with us, we will hear. Don't let God speak with us lest we die. Go to Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Now we started in Hebrews 12 at two mountains, right? We're not at one. We are at the other one. We're not dragging in between. We're going to use one and two. God who at various times and in various ways, I like the old King James here, God who at divers, sundry times and in divers manners. <laughs> sundry, sundry and divers. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. When did God do it? In various times and in various ways, God used to speak to our fathers by prophets. Various times, various ways, not all the time. God was not always talking. There were seasons in which God would talk. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Past tense. It's already done. Whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. In this time, you don't hear from God in seasons and in spurts and in various manners through other people's mouths. Now, if you want to hear from God, listen to Jesus. What do we say today? Whatever comes out of Jesus' mouth is the Holy Spirit. So you have the ability to hear the Holy Spirit, put that into your life. You are no longer waiting on a season. I hear Christians say, well, this is just, I'm just in a season where God's not talking to me. And I say, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. There is no such thing as a season where God is not talking to you. You are not living at Sinai. At Sinai, you'd have the right to say, God, in various times and in various manners, used to speak to us different seasons, different times, different ways, through other people. So if you were at Sinai, you'd have the right to say, hey, I'm in a season, God's not talking. I'm waiting on him to send me a word. But yet that still sounds like stuff I've heard in the church. You know, I'm not hearing from God, just a dry season. Somebody's going to send me a word. And these are the people that run up to you and go, do you have a word for me? <laughs> hey, 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 do you got a word for me? I'm in a, I'm in a dry season, you got a word for me? And it's because we don't realize that he's already spoken to us through Jesus. All we really need to do is see what Jesus has done to affect this situation. And there's the voice of God. Is why the more time we spend with Jesus, both meditating on Jesus, dwelling on Jesus, and reading about Jesus. I know we're in a, we're in a, we are in a season in the church where it's become sort of cool to diss the Bible. I'm seeing this a lot. A lot of armchair theologians acting like, well, you can't really trust it. All you really have to do is listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about what the Bible says or doesn't say. It also gives us a lot of excuses for why we will approve of some things and disapprove of other things. We go, well, the Bible's antiquated and not necessary. And yet, do you realize when you open those pages, you get to see what Jesus saw and what Jesus did and hear how Jesus dealt with it. And you get to hear what God is saying to you through his son. It's a powerful thing. So now let's, we've left. We're not in that valley. Let's go to the mountain that we're on. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 22, I know we read it once, worked our way through 22, 23, 24, let's do it again. But there's the rebuttal, there's the change. Notice there's no valley, there's no, there's no span of wandering between two mountains. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. That phrase, you have come, is in perfect tense in the Greek which means it has been accomplished, 
It is being accomplished and it will ever be accomplished. You have come. You came when Jesus died at Calvary. You, have, you came to it whenever you received Christ. You have come to it through revelations of his word. You come to it every time you realize you're hearing the voice of God through the spirit of Jesus. You have come, not you shall come, not someday you'll get there, not won't it be wonderful there, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to a heavenly Jerusalem. You contrast this with what Paul says in Galatians 4. In Galatians 4, Paul starts talking about Hagar and Sarah. Hagar is a product of Abraham's flesh. Hagar sleeps with young, or with, Abraham sleeps with young Hagar and he gets him an Ishmael. He thinks he's fulfilled the will of God. I got the male heir. God says, no, you don't have the male heir. In fact, God stops talking to him. Why? Because in times past, in various times and in various ways, God spoke to us and sometimes he didn't. And so for a long time, God didn't speak to Abraham because he had already got himself his heir, but he hadn't got himself God's heir. If you work with the flesh, you'll get something, but you won't get what God wants. So if you, I've always, I say this in a lot of churches, if you want people to immediately respond and change their actions for you, just give them some works and law. And some people will jump on that bandwagon and they'll change their works for you, but you will not see their hearts changed. In other words, if you need a product of the flesh, just sleep with Hagar. In nine months, you'll have an Ishmael. But if you want an Isaac, you're going to have to wait on God to do a miracle in Sarah. So that's going to take patience. It's just going to take hearing from God. Just relaxing and letting God do what he does. You've come to Zion, city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable company of angels. Contrasted to that fourth chapter of Galatians, Paul says there's a Jerusalem which now is, which is in bondage with her children. Jerusalem now is means there's a Jerusalem. It's a real Jerusalem. It's a city, but it's in bondage. He said, and there's also a heavenly Jerusalem. He said, and the heavenly Jerusalem is where Sarah and her promise live. Now, I did this and this, okay? Because I'm trying to show you where the natural Jerusalem was. And then we go, there's a heavenly Jerusalem. And we always tend to think heaven is there. What we talk about this morning, though, doesn't have anything to do with it being on a planet somewhere else. It has to do with Jesus being internalized inside of us. If I vanished, I will reappear in you, not outside of you, but inside of you. That's where he dwells. So if that's where he dwells, then the heavenly Jerusalem is not a place over on another planet, the heavenly Jerusalem is a place inside of you. Jesus called his disciples a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. The book of Revelation, the angel turns to John the Revelator and says, would you like to see the Lamb's bride? And John says, yes, I'd love to see the Lamb's bride. And God says, look this way. And I saw the heavens open and a city descend from God out of heaven. And that city was called the New Jerusalem and it was the Lamb's bride. Now, if you and I are waiting on the new Jerusalem, then we are not the Lamb's bride because the Lamb's bride doesn't descend until the end of the book of Revelation when the city descends on planet. But if you and I believe we are the Lamb's bride and we're a city set on a hill that cannot be hid and we've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, then we must be that Jerusalem setting on the planet affecting the world outside of that Jerusalem. In other words, what God is saying is my bride is my Jerusalem. My bride is my city. My bride has already arrived at the place that I want my bride to be. To an innumerable company of angels. Let me see the next verse, verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's us. You're not on your way to the church. You are the church. Again, I don't know that we realize that if we're still on our way to Mount Zion, we're not the church of the firstborn will someday be the church of the firstborn. I also love the fact that everybody in the church is firstborn. Isn't that good? See, we look at this and we think, well, he means the firstborn of Jesus. No, there are no secondborn sons in the kingdom of God. Everybody receives firstborn inheritance. Well, pastor, I'm not worthy of firstborn inheritance. Well, I would agree based upon your performance, based upon my performance, I'm not worthy. Of firstborn inheritance. Can I give you a little side story? Remember this? Jacob. Jacob's dying. And Joseph brings Ephraim and Manasseh, his two boys. And he walks them in front of old Jacob. Jacob's hands are creaky. Shaking. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew world, the firstborn son got the right hand blessing. 
The right hand blessing could only be given one time. Jacob tricks, remember this? Jacob tricks Isaac into giving it to him and then Esau shows up and goes, I'm here for my blessing. Why doesn't Isaac just go, okay, go tell your brother that last blessing didn't count? You ever wondered about that? Why didn't he, I, I used to confuse him. Why don't you just say, because just go say, hey, you cheated your brother. You don't get it. You couldn't. Once you laid that right hand on and you announced a, a blessing of God, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. You can't, you can't take it back. And here we are so bold as to believe that if God gave us the gift of salvation, if we fail enough, God take it back. <laughs> Woo is right. <laughs> That's worth wooing. And you put that right hand out there. So Joseph takes his boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, and he puts his oldest boy, Ephraim, on his left hand and his youngest boy, Manasseh, on his right hand, and he walks them to daddy because daddy's here. So daddy's right hand is going to go on the boy on the left. Okay. So Joseph plans it correctly. He does it according to the rule. And so he walks his sons in front of his father. And his father's blind. He's just simply moving by the Spirit at this point. He doesn't know who. He's just doing what he should do. And Joseph even sets it up to where all dad's really got to do is just sort of pick his hands up and drop them back down. And so when he puts the boys underneath his father, his father pulls both hands up in the air. The Bible says that he crosses his hands over. He lays his right hand on the youngest boy and he lays his left hand on the oldest boy and Joseph grabs daddy's hands and uncrosses them and said, no, father, you're doing it wrong. This is my oldest son. The blessing belongs to him. This is my youngest son. He deserves a left hand blessing. And dad shakes his hands away from Joseph and recrosses them, drops them back on the boys and said, truly, I know what I'm doing. The younger, the older shall serve the younger. He drops the right hand blessing on the youngest child. Jesus comes along preaching the exact same message of the kingdom, gets him put on the cross. Jesus says, in my daddy's kingdom, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. Jesus is saying the people that least deserve it will always be the first recipients of righteousness. People think they deserve it the most. I came for those, it sounds more like this in the King James. I came for those who think they can see to be made blind, those who can't see to be made to where they can. Jesus is saying, you come to me believing that you are worthy. That's that crossing of the hands. The only thing left for you is, is a works blessing second best but if you come to me as the one who does not deserve as the one who knows in whom he has believed i cross those hands for you i like to say at calvary jesus spread his hands out wide and took all of us in and at calvary god crossed his hands and slapped one on top of you and me in a position completely undeserving it and now we're resting in that firstborn of heaven Firstborn. Yeah. Registered in heaven, God the judge of all, spirits of just men made perfect. Don't freak out. The judge is not on Sinai. The judge is on Zion. At Sinai, you don't see the judge. You see him at Zion. And you might think, why is the judge at Zion? Remember what, how the chapter started? He chastises those that he loves. He disciplines his own children. But he's not the judge at Sinai because if he was the judge at Sinai, he'd whip you till you bled. He's the judge at Zion and judges at Zion don't whip you till you bleed. Judges at Zion deal with firstborn sons who have their registration in heaven who are just men made perfect. And listen, if you're guilty, you don't want to stand in front of a judge. But if you're innocent, you want a fair one. If you're innocent, you can prove it. Give me the best judge there is. Give me the one who's most in love with justice. That's the one I need because I'm innocent. How do you know you're innocent? I'm firstborn. I'm registered in heaven. I'm, I'm a just man made perfect. Bring on the judge. You want the discipline of Hebrews 12 because you realize you're not on an old mountain. You are at a new mountain at rest in who he is. The judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect. Please grab that last phrase and just hold on to it this week. I am not on my way to a mountain where just men shall be made perfect. I am at a mountain where just men are made perfect. You are justified. That's what just is shortened from. Remember what Paul says in Romans. God shows forth his righteousness in that he is both just and 
and justifier of those who believe on Christ Jesus. So God proves to you he is righteous when he justifies unrighteous people. You came to him as an unrighteous person. You received the righteousness of God. God proves he's just by making you righteous when you don't deserve it. The spirits of just men have been made perfect in Christ Jesus. What an awesome thing. It is to our shame that we can tell you those old Hebrew stories and can't tell you these two Hebrew mountains. And I, I, I'm believing you're, well, I'm in a house that knows those two Hebrew mountains already. But take that information, realize this isn't about a transitional valley. I do believe that spiritually and mentally we have people in that valley of transition. Okay? They don't realize that they're not at Sinai, but they don't yet realize what's theirs. They realize they're not at Sinai, but they don't realize what they have. But we've got other people that are hanging back here in awe over all the external holinesses. And they're getting exhausted. And they're wearing out. And their bones litter the trail of Christianity. Because they've just gotten worn out and tired. A lot of us came into grace because we had been holding on to Sinai for so long we were fried. We were just fried. And we heard, we'd been hearing the blasting of trumpets and thunders and lightnings, but then we heard that festal array in the Greek, that festal array of angels at Sinai. And the, and the spirits of just men made perfect in the church of the firstborn. We heard them singing from Zion and we started that journey. That, and there is that valley experience for a lot of people who are on their way. They, they know that doesn't work, but they're not really sure where they're, what, what, what's theirs. And so I encounter a lot of those people. And, they, and they'll tell me, I'm kind of wandering out here by myself. So I, don't really, I don't really have a church family. I don't really know anybody. I know I can't go back to Sinai. But I don't know what's mine. So I'm trying to liberate people into the knowledge that, that Zion's already yours. And the faster you can get there and grab hold of it and begin to experience the joys of what belongs on Zion, on Zion the faster you can begin to realize who you are in Christ, and you'll begin to see all these other things fall away in your life. But as just as we started, that's a journey. Take the steps. Walk through it. Enjoy the journey and realize that the Father's not mad at you because you're not moving fast enough. Right? He loves you. I want you to think about that last line for a second. And I'm going to be quiet. I, I've, I've just, I can feel this maybe directed for someone in this room. When you realize, when you have a revelation that you're at Zion, you realize Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. His blood says better things than Abel's blood. Cain kills his brother and the blood hits the dirt. The Bible says Abel's blood cries out. What does Abel's blood cry out for? Vengeance. I move very carefully here, okay, very cautiously, but I, we are in a society that is becoming infatuated with vengeance. Okay? We can blame it on movies and video games, but we have a heart response that's happening when we see bad things happening and we want people to get what's coming to them. I even saw someone who I greatly respected in grace make a comment about the vengeance of people who are in pedophilia or in rape and murder. And it was, may we show them no grace. And I know, and it was, just, it was from a place of pain. It was from a place of hurt. But I'm struck because the last thing you hear on the mountain in which you dwell is that Jesus' blood says better things than you're used to hearing Abel's blood say. See, Sinai is all about vengeance. And the reason why we are still a vengeance-minded people, people need to get what's coming to them, is because we still have one little piece of our hand reaching back to a vengeful mountain, going, that I hope people get what they deserve. And you have Jesus' blood freshly fallen on the ground at Zion, which speaks better things than the blood of Abel. And Jesus' blood says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Not revenge, but avenged. There's nothing being held against us. Pastor, don't you believe these people ought to be tried? Don't you believe these people ought to be prosecuted? Of course, there are natural consequences of what happens. I don't think anybody wants to take that away. But where, what where is the blood of Abel? Where, where do we have room for the blood of Abel on this mountain? How does the blood of Abel guide and govern a people of God who have left Sinai 
and have come to Zion. Abel's blood, vengeful blood doesn't belong in the kingdom. So that's the postscript to the message tonight. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this opportunity. What a chance. What a chance to talk to your people. You are wonderful. That next verse says to Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant speaks better things than that of Abel. That means if we can just make it to that mountain in our mind, if we can realize that that mountain is ours, that's the only mountain Jesus is living on. He's not living at Sinai. He's living at Zion. He's the mediator of better things. The blood of Jesus' covenant speaks better things than the blood of Abel's covenant. I thank you for that. I praise you for that. Seed that in our heart in Jesus' name. Amen.